Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my 19th lecture. Today we talk about hydropower. You all know about hydropower already and behind me you see the machine room of such a hydropower station. So hydropower is a very old technology. It is estimated that already 5000 years ago people were using hydropower. At this time it was of course not like here where you produce electricity, but they mainly used it to pump up water or to transport it. A somewhat more modern example is shown here. I think you can immediately guess how it works. So that the river, the river pulls the wheel and in front of the wheel there are bottles or cups you could say. And these cups are filled with water and then the wheel puts them upstairs. And then at the top the water flows out of the cups and it goes into a pipeline so that you can use this machine to water your fields. So it pumps up water by about one or two meters and this is one of the original applications of hydropower. It reminds me a little bit to what I showed you in my last lecture. There we had this perpetuum motion machine and as you know this was a fake machine but it's built almost the same. So if you would cut the bottles at the end, then you would have almost the machine as here on this river. The main difference is the machine at the river is really working and it's useful, whereas the perpetual motion machine is fake and does not work in reality. I guess most of you have seen a water mill already. A water mill works in a simple principle. You have water coming down a hill and then it turns a wheel, so the gravity of the water pulls the wheel down and this is why it starts to rotate. And then you can use that. So you can use it for milling, for producing your flour, or you can also use it for pumping up water or to do any other kind of mechanical work with it. The main difference to a modern hydropower station is that, as seen on the picture here, at the end, you produce electricity. So in the picture you see from the wall there are the pipes with water under high pressure coming in. The water is then turning a turbine and the turbine runs a generator and the generator produces the electricity. I will explain that in a later lecture in more detail. There are many types of hydropower stations and I would like to start with the smallest ones so we also call them hydropower microturbines because they produce electricity at a smaller scale. A typical application is shown here in this picture. So you must have some water flowing somewhere. So let's take a small river. Then the river flows down in nature somehow. So what you have to do is now you have to take part of the water out and use it for your hydropower stations. In the old days they had channels along the hills. Nowadays you would probably use pipes under pressure, so-called penstocks. And then at the end the water arrives downstairs at the power station with high pressure. And then this power station runs a turbine and the turbine runs a generator and to produce electricity, which you can distribute in your neighborhood. This is a very simple way to do it. It's possible to do it even more simple, just locally. And this is shown on the next picture here. The method which is applied here is somewhat different to a normal turbine. It's called a gravitation water vortex. So there's water spinning around. You know that from your bath at home, if the water is going out, then there are normally some vortices rotating around, going down the drain, and this way the water flows out. If you put a turbine into this drain, then you can use this rotating vortex to run your wheel. And this way you convert the energy of the water into a mechanical rotational energy. And here in the picture you see on top there's a what looks like a motor. This is a generator which then has a cable and the electricity is produced using this small generator here. I have also a video which I can show you where this thing is applied. So this video is taken 
in Chile, in a small village. There's a small river. It has a height difference here of only 1.7 meters. And this small hydropower station produces 15 kilowatts, which is quite enough for a village usually, I would say. So how does it work? It's shown here in the film. You see here the water flowing into the turbine. And you see when the water flows down the drain, it starts to rotate. And this rotation runs the turbine. So you see the turbine spinning here when the water goes through. So the nice thing about this turbine is that everything is very compact. You can carry the whole stuff in one lorry and it's easy to install and it's easy to operate. So it's something very useful in the country where you need a local energy supply which is easy to operate. <laughs> now we go from the very small hydro turbines to big sizes. So you can build hydropower stations at almost any size. A big one is shown here on this picture. This is a big hydropower station in Brazil at the border of Brazil and Paraguay. It's a really huge dam. It has a length of seven kilometers and is about 200 meters high. It produces 14 gigawatts. But this is not yet the biggest one which we have on our globe. The biggest one is the Three Gorges Dam at the Yangtze River in China. It has a height of also about 200 meters, but it has a power of 22 gigawatts. So in other words, this is the biggest hydropower station and it replaces about 22 nuclear power plants. There are many ways to produce this hydropower station. Another example here is the Hoover Dam at the Colorado River in the US. This produces about 2 gigawatt and has a wall of 220 meters height. So it's also a quite impressive building in this narrow valley here. There are other hydro stations like the one here at the Columbia River. This one is not so high, just 72 meters high, and it produces even more power than the Hoover Dam. So it's about 2.6 gigawatt. So for some reason, it's not only the height, but it's, as you can imagine, also the amount of water which flows through, which defines the power of such a hydro station. Here's an even smaller example. This is in Germany somewhere. The height here is only about five meters and it produces three megawatts. So even with a dam which is very small, you can produce hydroelectricity. In this case, then you call it the run of the river hydroelectricity because it's just a running water of the river which produces this energy. Quite the opposite design is shown here. This here is a picture from Switzerland and there are three different lakes at different heights. There is one lake at the very top here at about 2475 meters. Then there is a second lake which you see down here 1800 meters high and there is a third lake behind which you cannot see in the valley which is 811 meters high. And there are pipes or penstocks between these lakes inside of the mountains. So you can let the water go through these pipes and at the end of the pipes you have these turbines. So you can generate electricity and you have a height difference of about 1600 meters. So this is something which you can do of course only if you are in high mountains. The power production of this station here can be up to about 1.4 gigawatt. But you can imagine to produce this 1.4 gigawatt you need a lot of water and especially the upper lake will not have a lot of water because there's just a little bit of rain and snow there. So how can you make use of this? Well, and that is something I will explain in a future lecture when we talk about energy storage. The main purpose of this hydro station here is not to produce electricity. The main purpose is to store electricity. So what is being done is the following. Whenever there is enough electricity available, they use big pumps to pump up the water 
from the valley up to 2400 meters to the upper lake and whenever there is a shortage of electricity they let the water go down again and use the energy of the water to produce electricity again. So this is called a pump storage hydro station and this is mainly used to store electricity. In the following picture you see a second example also here you have a lower lake and you have a higher lake on top of this mountain and you see the pipes here which pump up the water, store the water on top of the hill and then whenever you need electricity you let the water go down again and produce electricity from the potential energy of the water. As I said, pump storage stations is something we will discuss in the chapter about electricity storage and there are quite a few new developments which we have to discuss at this point then. Now let's go to another option. You don't always have mountains or rivers and it turns out you can also use the ocean. In the ocean there is an infinite amount of water, so there is water which is enough. But of course you have to make the water flowing in order to produce electricity. And the way it was done here in France is they use the tidal power. As you know there is high and low tides. In this area in France the height of the tides is especially large. So how do they use the tidal power in this power station? Well you have a bay area which is here in front of this aerial view. So whenever there is a high tide the ocean flows water into the bay and when there is a low tide the water flows back. What did the people do in France? They made a dam and they put turbines in the dam and this is then a very easy way to produce energy because each time the tide is going up the water flows through the turbines and you see that here in this picture. If the ocean has a high tide the water flows through the turbine into the bay and then six hours later the bay will have a high water level but the ocean will go to low tide so the water flows back into the ocean and the turbine is constructed in a way that it works with both water direction so if the water goes from left to right or from right to left they just change the orientation of the turbine and in both cases they produce electricity from it. The nice thing about it is of course that you have electricity at a very well-defined rhythm so you can calculate at which time of the day you can produce electricity and at which time of the day there is no change of the tide. These tidal power stations in principle have a really huge potential because the power which is in the ocean is really great. But of course there is not always the possibility to have a big bay with which you can cut off from the ocean by a big dam. So that is the limitation. That is why there are not so many tidal power stations around. And of course you can think about different methods to use that. So in a more general way it's ocean currents which produce the electricity here. The ocean current can either come from tides or it can also come from big ocean currents like the North Atlantic Ocean Current which goes across the Atlantic for example. So the easiest way to do it if you are not able to make a dam you do it without a dam and your turbine then looks more like a propeller. It's in principle equivalent what we do in wind power only that these propellers are much smaller than in wind power. The reason why they can be much smaller is because the energy density of water, of water which is flowing is much larger than the energy density of wind. So these marine currents here have power densities which you can use of about 15 kilowatts per square meter. This is a factor of 10 to 100 higher than the density of a wind where you use the wind energy. In this sense the amount of power which you can use from ocean currents is really immense and huge. There are only a few prototypes today which are working. There's one at the coast of Great Britain. It has 300 kilowatt 
so you see the propeller here for maintenance reason you can push up the propeller and then for operation you pull it down of course under the ocean surface and then it starts to rotate because of the current of the ocean and at this area where they put it there's a rather high current. The nice thing compared to wind power here is as I said already before first of all the much higher energy density and secondly it's much more reliable and constant because the ocean current is not fluctuating as the wind is fluctuating. The only problem is there is no major technology available. There are prototypes which are working, but of course those things are complicated and expensive. Whenever you work in the sea, things become of course a lot more complicated. You also need cables to the shore to make use of it. And the other problem of course is uh, the energy which you can take out of the current is just a very small area around your machine. You would really need big propellers or you would need a barrier to get a significant fraction of this marine power. I think there is a lot of potential for future developments, but at the moment we cannot count too much on it. Another example for a new technology is shown here with this rotating wheels where the rotation has a horizontal axis but also that is uh, not at a state where you would have an efficient and cheap way to produce a lot of electricity with it. Now I would like you to understand a little bit of the physics and the technology so don't be afraid it won't be too complicated I think everybody can follow these explanations. So this is here a sketch of a hydropower station so you see the barrier dam on the left, the water is stored on the left side. There's an intake where the water goes out through the dam. So the water flows through this penstock and it has a quite high pressure there because of the height of the lake. Then this pressurized water goes through a turbine. The turbine is turning from that and then the water flows out into a river or a second lake. Connected to the turbine is a generator which produces electricity and then the electricity is just going into the grid and is available for the people around. How do you now calculate the amount of power which you can get out of such a hydropower station? Well, we have seen there are many different types of power stations. Some of them have a very high dam, some of them have a lot of water. And I guess you can understand that what finally counts is the product of height and the water flow. Yes? So the more water there is flowing, the more energy you can make out of it. And the higher the water is, the higher the water pressure becomes and the more potential power is in the water. So in this sense, it's clear how to calculate the stuff. But we, I don't want only to explain you how to calculate something. I want to show you an example now so that you get the feeling uh, it's really doable and you really understand what has to be done. So the task which we now have to fulfill is we go to a nice area. So this is one of the nicest places on our planet. This is in Iceland here. There's a nice waterfall and imagine you have the crazy idea and want to have a hydropower station in this area. Yeah, I would not recommend to do so because the nature is perfect there and we should not destroy it. But just as a physics example, let's imagine you have a lot of money and you want to get a lot of profit. So you want to produce a power station at this point. The only information you have is that the waterfall has a height of 45 meters. And the amount of water there is typically 200 cubic meters per second, which is flowing down the waterfall. And then the question is, if you would build a power station there, how much power would come out of this? If you are not used to physics, you might think that you have no idea how to calculate that. But actually, from the formulas of the last lecture, you are able to calculate that. So the nice thing here is you don't have to build a barrier wall because the barrier is already there. You just have to collect the water on the top, put it into a pipe 
and have a turbine at the end of the time downstairs. So let's now step by step to the calculation. So let's go back to this five minutes of physics and this time it should really be five minutes and not longer. So how does it work? And last time I told you what power is. We want to calculate the power of this hydro station which we are going to build. Power is always work divided by time. This is always valid. And the second formula you learned last time was that work is force times distance, always. So if we apply that now to our hydropower station in Iceland, what does it mean? The force we are talking about is water falling down. So what we need is the weight of the water. So the force is a weight and the weight of water is 9.81 times the mass of the water in the right units. And as work is force times distance, we also need the distance. Well, the distance, which is relevant here, are these 45 meters from the top down to the bottom of the waterfall. Next question is, what is the mass of the water which is going down? Well, we have the number of the volume. So we know how many cubic meters per second are going down. And from that, we have to calculate how much kilograms per second are going down. And this you all have learned at school. You know that one liter of water, so I even brought you one here. This is one liter of water is exactly one kilogram. This is how it was defined uh, originally. So I also have my stone here. The stone, you know already from last lecture, is exactly one kilogram. This is one liter water. And if you weight them, you find out, you see the water is a bit more heavy because of the plastic bottle around it. But otherwise it's both exactly one kilogram. So now you know how to convert kilogram into liter. Now you have to learn how to convert liter into cubic meter. And I guess you know that still from school, that just thousand liters is one cubic meter. And now you have all the numbers and all the quantities which you know to really calculate yourself the amount of power, the amount of power which you can generate in this waterfall here at Iceland. So the only thing you have to do is you put all these numbers together and multiply everything you have a bit more precisely. You go through all these formulas and you start with the first one. You take the power as work by time. Uh, for work, you set force by distance. For force, you set 9.81 times mass. For mass, you say one kilogram per liter times volume. And then you put in all the other numbers which you have, and then you get the final result. So you get out that the power which comes out of your hydropower station at this waterfall is 9.81 Newton per kilogram. The number which tells you something about gravitation multiplied with a kilogram per liter, a number which is specific to water multiplied by the height of the waterfall, 45 meters, multiplied by this 200 cubic meters per second, which is 200,000 liter per second. And then if you multiply everything, you get out 88 millions. And the units, if you collect all the units, you find out that it's in Newton meter per second. Newton meter is force times distance is energy. so it Newton meter is joule and joule per second, as you know, is what? So the final result is that the power from this hydropower station switch you can build is 88 megawatts. So it's quite an amount of power which comes out and it could serve all the people in the area with electricity. One thing we should not forget is this is an ideal calculation in reality, things are not perfect. And therefore, for every machine, you have an efficiency. The efficiency tells you if you have energy conversions inside of your machine, you have to assign an efficiency which tells you how much of the energy which you put in comes out as useful energy. And for a good hydropower station, the efficiency is very high. It's about 90%. So you have to multiply the final result with 90%, so you have a total power of 80 megawatts. The other 10%, so the other 8 megawatts, then 
are dissipated in the machine in the hydropower station. Typically what will happen is there will be some heat produced and this will be cooled by the water so you will finally heat up the water in the river a little bit. So the energy is of course conserved, there is no energy missing at the end, but not everything will come out as electrical power. So now you are all able to calculate the specifications of a hydropower station as I showed you in this example from Detifoss in Iceland. But just to repeat, please don't build a hydropower station there. The nature there is so untouched and so beautiful that there are certainly better areas where you can produce renewable energies. In the following diagram here, I show you how the amount of hydropower is increasing on our planet. So the diagram starts in 2010 with a scale of about 1000 gigawatt and today we have about 1100 gigawatts of hydropower on our planet and you see there is a tendency of rising but there is no steep rise and the reason why there is no steep rise is because all the very well suited areas for hydropower stations or a lot of them at least are already taken so there is not so much potential left over to produce very much more hydropower. There is a second diagram on the bottom. This is 120 gigawatts of pump storage. So about 10% of the hydropower is not used to produce electricity but to store electricity. And this is the important thing for our renewable energy system because the electrical power we can also generate with solar power at a much bigger scale but we cannot produce it at night. So if we have a tool to store power during the day and use it during the night, then this is much more important than to produce a few gigawatt more of hydropower. So at the end of the lecture, now I want to summarize the advantages and disadvantages of hydropower. There are quite a few advantages of hydropower. First of all, from the sustainability point of view, it's a very good technology. It produces renewable energies. It has relatively low material consumption. It's basically the turbine and the generator as high-tech products. And then depending where you are, you have to have some pressure pipes and then of course the barrier for the lake if you need it. The technology is very old and very major. We have very high efficiencies of on the order of 90%. You can build hydropower stations at all scales from a micro station of a few kilowatt up to a few gigawatt. The operation of course has all the advantages of renewable energies. It doesn't use any fuel. It doesn't produce pollution. It doesn't produce CO2. And in addition, hydropower has low maintenance cost and also low risk. There's nothing which explodes normally. Of course, there can be problems with the dam, but we know we can operate hydropower stations for 50 years without any accidents. One of the very big advantages of hydropower is its availability. Normally, in the old days, you produced power all the time. But for the renewable energy transition, it's much more important that with hydropower you can produce the power when it's needed and at times where there's less needed, you don't produce as much. So you can use hydropower stations as regulating power stations. And the other very important point is that you can use hydropower stations as electricity storage and both those things the regulation of power on demand and the storage of power will be discussed in the context of another lecture where we discuss storage in general. There are of course also negative points of hydropower. The main point is that hydropower can be in conflict with a lot of other things. The first thing is of course nature and environment. If you have an area where there is no lake and you put a barrier lake there, you change completely nature in this area. And depending on what kind of nature it is, of course, this can be very negative. The second point is in a way a positive but also a negative point. It's a conflict of water with agriculture. Mostly these barrier dams which are built have two purposes. 
One is hydroelectricity and the second one, which is at least as important, is the storage of water for times when there is less water. And especially, of course, for agriculture. So this is in a way a plus because it's a combined object which satisfies as well agriculture as electricity consumption. However, there can be conflicts because the time when there's electricity needed is not necessarily the time when there's water needed. So if you run your station as a hydroelectricity station, you would produce electricity at the time when you need it most, for example in the winter. Whereas if you run it as a water storage for agriculture, you probably would need the water in spring or summer. So this is one conflict. Another conflict with agriculture might be that if you have a big lake, there's a lot of evaporation, so part of the water is lost. Not 100% of the water which flows into the lake also comes out, so you lose water. This might be a problem in areas where there's very little water. Then, of course, you can be in conflict with ships on rivers. So the navigation requires that there's always water in the river. So also at that time when you don't specially need electricity. And the last point is tourism and water sport. Often these barrier lakes are used for tourism. And then, of course, if in summer the lake is empty, it's not very much fun for summer holidays. And the last point, which is a new point, is that because of climate change, there are many areas where there's not as much water anymore than there has been before. That also means that the total amount of hydropower which can be generated will be less. So if you are planning a new hydropower station now, you have to take into account that maybe in 10 or 50 years there's much less water and then you have a much lower output of your hydropower station. Then two more comments on the future. The first thing is that there are quite a few new ideas for hydro storage systems. So I will talk about that in a lecture about energy storage. And the next thing is, as I mentioned already before, I think there's a very high potential to use hydroelectricity from marine currents because the total amount of energy is high. But of course, it's difficult to access it. And I have no idea if there will be future technologies which can really make use of that at large scale. So this is already the end of this lecture about hydropower. So I wish you a nice time to relax at one of the barrier lakes in your local areas. This lake here is close to Gießen. So thank you very much for listening and hope to see you next time again. And I'm still thinking about what the subject of the next lecture could be. Thank you and see you again next time. Thank you.